Hi, I'm Lisa Joy Sigorski with the National Science Foundation. Welcome to our webcast, Cracking the Code of HIV, Planning a Counterattack. Eight weeks ago, the science and engineering community celebrated the dedication of one of the world's most powerful supercomputers, Blue Waters. Blue Waters is not only fast, more important, it is capable of sustained petascale computing, enabling the processing of big data and the creation of detailed simulations at the atomic level. It is located at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, or UIUC, as I'll call it. Prior to its official opening, a handful of research teams got a head start and were allowed to test the computational power afforded by Blue Waters and one team has already made an exciting discovery. Using Blue Waters on a sample size of 64 million atoms, a team from UIUC has made a discovery that will be featured later this week in the cover story of the journal Nature. Two of the team's researchers are here today to discuss their findings. Now, let me turn to my guests. In the studio with me is Irene Qualters, Irene is a Program Director for Advanced Cyber Infrastructure here at the National Science Foundation. And joining us remotely is Dr. Klaus Schulten, a physics professor at UIUC, and his postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Juan Parilla. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Klaus, you are the principal investigator of this incredible project. Tell us, what did your team, what did your team discover? Uh, welcome, uh, Irene and Lisa. Uh, we were extremely fortunate uh, uh, that, that uh, the Blue Waters computer just came in time to permit us to make a great discovery. It was uh, the needed computer, but it was also just some perfect timing that permitted us to solve one of the uh, most uh, pressing problems in medicine today namely uh, to find a uh, uh, new treatment against um, uh, AIDS. AIDS is caused by the HIV drugs and uh, by the HIV virus. And uh, uh, I'm a professor of physics. And the medical problem that we have to solve is actually really also a physics problem. And it re needed uh, a very large computer, the kind we never had before. So it's simply that, um, the following problem, that um, when a cell gets infected by the HIV virus, uh, the virus releases its um, uh, capsid, that is a container of the virus's genes, into the cell. And this, uh, this container is uh, uh, holding the genes in a stable form, but then interacting with the cell, the container suddenly breaks open and releases uh, its content. And this is a complicated machinery that uh, the virus needs to infect the cell, and it's a perfect target for uh, fighting uh, the infection. Now, the problem is, however, in order to fight it pharmacologically, you need to know the chemical detail of the um, of this capsid, and uh, the problem is that this capsid is huge. Uh, today we actually solved the structure of the capsid, and we know it's made of three million atoms. It's a larger structure that ever was discovered uh, 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 in living cells as one of the structures that arise there. And uh, in order to handle this kind of structure, we needed enormous computer power that on the one side combined experiments, namely crystallography and NMR structure analysis and electron microscopy experiments that are often used to solve such, such structures with computing because only computing could combine the experimental data and interpret them in terms of a structure. And that is what we could do with the Blue Waters computer. And we could then also, as uh, uh, Lisa had already described, simulate uh, the capsid, a 64 million atom simulation 
necessary uh, to characterize this capsid and now we can give this capsid as a fully characterized, it's atomic level characterized structure to the pharmacological community to develop uh, better treatments against AIDS. Excellent. Excellent. What was the hardest step in the process of discovering the structure of the, of the HIV capsid? The hardest step was easy for me, but uh, difficult <laughs> for Juan Peria who texted me. The hard actually to be bold enough to do it. So when we actually applied for computer resources, our referees told us, don't do this, this is way too difficult, you just waste resources. Uh, that was not an argument for us to not try it, but we were really scared. Uh, so I, as an advisor, almost felt like I, I couldn't push Juan as a postdoc in charge of the project to do it. But uh, somehow it happened. We, we were very fortunate that, that the blue water machine came just at the right moment, but also uh, uh, Juan turned out to be an absolutely outstanding young researcher who learned on the job and made something possible that I was thinking was almost impossible. But uh, this is how often the greatest uh, discoveries happen. You need to be bored. How long did it take to make the discovery? And Juan, what was it like learning on the job? Uh, well, it took... Okay, so for us it took over a year. For the general community, people have been working on this for several years. Um, uh, learning in the job of... I mean, Klaus is talking more about like the molecular biology involved in, in all these. So it was a, it's a fascinating problem from every perspective, from biomedical aspect and from the molecular biology aspect, as well as from the physical aspect. So it's a, it's, a, it's quite motivating because it's a really challenging problem and um, it mixes a lot of, a lot of uh, different fields all together. Irene, um, both gentlemen have described the power of Blue Waters and the importance of it in making this discovery. Can you describe Blue Waters a little bit and moreover how it fits in the NSF context of advanced cyber infrastructure? So uh, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to Klaus Swan and the enti their entire research team on their advance and fundamental understanding of the HIV capsid. It's really what we had hoped for in, uh, in boldly investing in Blue Waters. And underlying this advance in part is a conceptual vision of 21st century research which combines theoretical, experimental, and computational methods. And such an approach requires interdisciplinary uh, thinking um, and teams. And uh, as Klaus has said, uh, boldness is absolutely required, but um, boldness and teams who are prepared uh, to step up to that challenge are, are really fundamental to this approach to 21st century research. And Klaus and his team are representative of those who over time have built multi-generational teams with uh, biological, physical, mathematical, and computer science expertise. But the vision also requires bold but sustained investment in both people and systems. And in some ways, the computer system is akin to a other large instruments like telescopes. NSF is really quite proud to support the University of Illinois um, Urbana-Champaign with its partners, such as the state of Illinois, in acquiring, deploying, and operating the Blue Water System which was used for this massive and complex molecular dynamics simulation. Klaus's team is one of approximately 30 different research teams in a variety of domains that are just beginning to use this system. Um, we could not be more pleased uh, with Klaus Wan and the entire team's early and tremendous results, and um, we hope this is just the beginning of uh, other similar results from his and other teams. Thanks, Irene. 
Okay, we have a question that was submitted by email from Ben Ryan, who is an editor-at-large of Paws Magazine, AIDSmeds.com. And Ben would like us to disentangle uh, the discovery a bit. Take us through, um, Klaus or Juan, can you use layman's terms and really pull apart the parts of the discovery, how you use blue waters, the steps that you took in order to uncover the structure of the capsid as you did? So, um, so you, you might be surprised that computing can help actually with studying viruses. And uh, in fact, uh, computing in a way cannot. But what it can do is the following. It can take the experimental data from different approaches. In this case, from um, cryptography, from uh, NMR structure analysis, in particular from electron microscopy, and combine them and then find which atomic structure, which chemical structure represents actually all the data taken. And only the computer can do this. And uh, that is that was one of the roles that the computer did to find the, 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 the best uh, agreement between an atom by atom uh, structure of this capsid all together, three million atoms with the available experimental data. Once we had this structure, then we could put them onto blue waters. Actually, already this analysis uh, was done in blue waters, but then we could give it the blue waters to a big simulation. Uh, uh, this is just a kind of simulation that Boeing, for example, does when they develop their Dreamline, Dreamliner uh, uh, um, uh, 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 airplane. Uh, they simulate everything on the computer and then they know how it flies and today we have so much knowledge about the molecules in cells that we can actually simulate even something as big as a capsid virus in the computer to describe what kind of physical characteristics um, this capsid has and so on the so in short we could interpret with the computer the available co very complex data and we could then, just like simulating an airplane, we could simulate a uh, virus uh, to see how this uh, structure that we discovered together with our experimental colleagues actually behaves. But Juan might uh, add to, to what I just told you. So, <clears throat> like, um, the structure of the HIV capsule has been a standing problem for many years. Like, uh, we, we have known that it exists because people see it in cryotomography data. Like, you can look at it uh, as a blob in, a, in an experiment. Um, the actual atomic detail of the structure has been unknown, and people have been able to like solve small parts of the structure. Uh, what we did is we put all this information together, and we were able to come up with a, mo with a model for the entire structure. Now, the, the entire structure is, uh, as Klaus said earlier, it's a... Uh, it's a, a new term, uh, a new pharmaceutical, uh, a new pharmaceutical target that hasn't been exploited so far. So that means, uh, in the case of HIV, that uh, develops tolerance to every single treatment. It hasn't had a chance to develop tolerance to any treatment against uh, the capsid. What will this mean for individuals who have HIV, who are infected with the AIDS virus? How soon will they reap the benefits of your discovery? That's hard to tell um, because there's always uh, a lot of detailed work necessary. But um, we already two months after the discovery of the structure went to, uh, to, uh, to see how certain uh, drug molecules that were identified uh, as being potential drugs that can interfere with the uh, capsid, uh, how they actually work when they are binding to the capsid. Juan is doing calculations already very intensely, and he may tell us more about where they are going, 
But if I may just summarize that we are now working hard in, in seeing how certain drug molecules interact with this capsid. Only now that we have the capsid, can we actually help pharmacologists to do their studies with, uh, without being blind. Before they could do studies with, with certain drugs and see how they in, uh, interact with the capsid. But uh, it was blindly. It was just trial and error. Whereas now, when they say, oh, we want to try out this molecule, we can add it to the capsid, see how it interacts with the capsid, and then tell them, oh, it doesn't work so well because here is something not optimal. You might want to modify slightly your drug to get a better outcome. But Juan is doing it. very intense calculations at the moment, and he might tell you uh, from the trenches how we actually is now exploiting the discovery that we made. Okay, uh, so first off, hopefully we won't be the only ones doing those calculations. We're doing our calculations, but uh, as whenever you publish one of these structures, you hope many people are going to be working on the structure and you're going to get a benefit from them. And on, on the other hand, we, uh, we are like studying certain properties of the whole capsid that are could possibly be exploited as a as a as a as the develop for the de development of a new drug. I just want to I just want to remind people listening on the phone line if you'd like to answer a question, please dial star one on your touchstone phone, and we're accepting questions submitted via email as well. Webcast at nsf.gov. Um, so I'm trying to understand, gentlemen. You're talking about now having a um, the exact structure. Yet there have been a lot of pro progress that antiviral drugs have experienced in recent years in managing the virus and letting people live near normal lives. It sounds like um, understanding the full structure will make drugs and drug therapy even, or can make drugs and drug therapy even more effective. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Juan knows this better than I. I, will, I may just start out with saying that uh, the therapies we have against HIV infection are all constantly being challenged by the virus that evades them and finds mutations that uh, overcome therapies. And so we need to constantly fight and find new targets to attack the virus. And uh, the capsid is um, literally a huge target in terms of its great a large chemical structure, um, but it's also a novel target. Uh, um, we have many antiviral drugs for other viruses that target their capsids, but those capsids are smaller and they could be um, elucidated in their structure, in their chemical composition, much more easily than the elusive uh, HR capsid. And so now we have basically a new kind of target that we know much better that could help uh, not only to just get through one more small door uh, in fighting the, uh, the uh, HIV infection, but rather we have a large new door that, uh, that gives us many opportunities. But Juan uh, knows it very well because he works actually intensely on, um, on molecules that interfere with the structure function of the capsid, and he may tell us a little bit more. Juan, did so, you want um, to add? Well, so Klaus um, pretty much said uh, all that um, I was going to say, but um, yeah, um, in in principle, uh, this uh, hopefully this uh, this paves the way to the development of a new drug. If uh, not in the next couple of I mean, not in the next couple of months, in the next couple of years, and uh, that's kind of what we're giving away is that the possibility that anyone, not only us, can work on this capsid and and uh, using the methods that are already out there, try to develop a new drug. I'm just wondering, the disciplines that were involved in developing um, the discovery of this HIV capsid, is the methodology developed for this problem 
transferable to other diseases, to other capsids, to other structures that will be useful in treating disease? Uh, the answer is a resounding yes. Um, uh, we have here in Illinois developed uh, the methodology of um, uh, determining the structure of very large um, biomolecular systems uh, by combining different types of experiments, namely uh, crystallography and electron microscopy and others. We we called this uh, method molecular dynamics flexible fitting uh, and that encapsulates our approach that we are using the computer to find structures that are in agreement not only with one type of experiment data but with a hybrid uh, set of experimental data and we could we could apply this methodology already to many biomolecular systems in the cell uh, to find out how their structures look like that couldn't be determined without our methodology and uh, in many cases that led also directly to medical applications. Uh, one, one example is uh, the ribosome that is a machine in the cell that reads the genetic information of the cell and uh, translates it into the product of a cell. It turns out that um, uh, antibiotics are targeting bacterial ribosomes because they are sufficiently different from human ribosomes. So basically you throw with an antibiotic a wrench into the bacterial ribosome so that they cannot make new proteins so well. Uh, but you don't harm the ribosomes of the human body. And that uh, is a very promising strategy. Unfortunately, uh, many of the bacteria developed resistance against antibiotics, and so we constantly have to find new ones, and so we must understand very, very well uh, how antibiotics actually work. And only the approach that we took that combines actually crystallography and electron microscopy could help us with antibiotics. And so similar, we have uh, now uh, uh, the case of uh, AIDS and the HIV infection. That's tremendous. Um, we're talking about the supercomputer's use in making simulations that are incredibly useful for medicine. But Irene, as I understand it, NSF has devoted resources to supercomputers and advanced computation and advanced cyber infrastructure to help along a wide range of various disciplines. Could you share with us a little bit about NSF's investments, why they're important, and what implications they might have for other fields? So uh, I think that um, if I put this in the context of Blue Waters. Blue Waters is one, uh, certainly the largest single investment that NSF currently has made in its computational infrastructure. And among, and that's targeted for a small number of teams with uh, very intense requirements such as uh, is exhibited in Klaus's uh, 64 million atom um, molecular dynamics simulation. Uh, and among those 30 teams, there are uh, quite a large number in the areas of astronomy. Um, there's, uh, uh, there are also uh, several engineering, uh, one in nanoelectronics, uh, actually a, a several in nanoelectronics, and a few in multi-objective uh, design optimization uh, in uh, such things as uh, design of a satellite constellation to support uh, 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 monitoring over time of the Earth's water, uh, freshwater resources. Uh, but that's, uh, that's really one level of investment. The, uh, but we invest uh, both at the national level, at, a, at the shared infrastructure, and we have a number of large, NSF supports a number of um, large systems and medium systems. Uh, it also uh, supports domain-specific uh, cyber infrastructure that includes computational 
uh, capabilities such as uh, at uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, and uh, so it really supports a wide breadth. And frankly, we are trying to advance both those that are highly computationally intensive, but into new areas that have uh, not before um, been users of cyber infrastructure. So in some of the areas of um, image analysis, graph analytics, uh, natural language processing, uh, as those uh, scientific domains become more computationally intense, uh, more of NSF's investment is going to broaden our capabilities for those communities as well. I was talking to a chemist, and she was noting how incredible this discovery was, noting that she had done in her lab simulations of just a few atoms and how long it took. This is a question, I guess, for the whole group. Could this work have been done without a supercomputer? If so, how long would it take? Can you give us some sense of the scale and what this has meant? Maybe Klaus or Juan, we'll start with you guys. Okay, okay. Um, so, so the fact is that Blue Waters gives us a computational power that is 20 to 50 times more than the computers we had about a year ago. And that, uh, that is a power that if you translate it into the resolving power of a telescope that can look much further into the universe, or of an accelerator that can now have much more intense uh, X-ray radiation to resolve uh, the structures of materials and, uh, and, and living systems, and we have now here a computational microscope, a computational microscope that uh, has much more resolving power than was possible before. And you know when you are using uh, a, 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 a binoculars and somebody gives you one that you use for the concert hall or for the opera, you cannot look very far with it. And if somebody gives you one that you use for um, hunting, you can see the deer from far away that you couldn't see with the opera glasses. And so really this computer permits us to look much further, deeper into living cells than we ever could do before. It's just, you know, maybe we could faintly see it, but it's not so much that we might have just waited longer and so the, there is a convenient factor involved in using blue waters. No, it is simply that the kind of large structure that we had to deal with here was not possible to even put into the computer in order to begin simulating it. So it was not uh, just, oh, we can do it faster and, uh, and scientists uh, can do their job uh, faster and can go home earlier, but rather we can now do a new class of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, of problems. Like, for example, right now we have uh, researchers from the University of California in uh, uh, San Diego visiting that uh, do a very similar calculation that we uh, pioneered for the uh, HIV virus on influenza virus. The influenza virus is in a way even more complicated than the, uh, than the um, uh, HIV virus in that it is more complex and larger and it requires actually simulations of over 200 million atoms. And so here, we are, here is a new example coming up that I predict that will also work out nicely where the common cold might be uh, uh, now the next target and where uh, we might uh, go to Walgreens uh, in a few years and get a better bottle against a common cold than we ever had before. So we really have a situation that Blue Waters permitted us to do, to use our computational microscope for, uh, for studies that were simply not possible before, rather than uh, couldn't be as conveniently. 
Irene, are there are there parts of Blue Waters that make it distinctive as a machine that was able to handle this load? Well, I can. I think uh, Klaus w could speak about the particular simulation, but I will say uh, that the design and selection and introduction of this system was uh, particularly to support uh, the research, Klaus is, is among them, but the research that was planned that could not be done anywhere else. And so the ability of the researchers to attain the kind of performance that they need with the large scale, some of them require very large scale I.O. and high performing I.O., uh, lots of memory. There is no other combination like that, um, either in NSF or elsewhere, that could support the range of topics uh, at the, at the uh, level of performance that was needed to conduct the research. And um, it, I would also say that uh, part of why the decision was made for such a system was that um, along with Klaus uh, and the other research teams, the University of Illinois has been working with them for the last, in some cases, six years uh, to better understand what they really needed to conduct their planned research. And so the system design was ultimately a result of that investigation. So, and I don't know if Klaus has other comments that he would say r relative to the particular uh, um, molecular uh, dynamic simulation that he was conducting. Yeah, I would be glad to, to, to add to Irene's comments. Uh, you know, first I must really thank uh, NSF for their very long-range vision and for their very hard work to make uh, the Blue Waters computer possible. So I already uh, got my Blue Waters grant, I think, six years ago. There was uh, no computer yet inside. The name was there, the idea was there, but um, there was, in a way, uh, the need of, uh, of trust that it would actually eventually happen. But NSF had invested intensely and developed intensely the computer power for American scientists. And they are basically the only uh, uh, game in town where we can get that kind of computer power. And so um, we, we, we learned to work with them very well and we trusted them and we started them to work with many parties that were involved in the Blue Waters computer. So there was first the National Center for Supercomputing Applications that, the, that uh, is the eventual site of, uh, of the computer. And the staff really did an incredible uh, job in helping us in, in many ways to connect us, for example, to the vendors, to the Intel, the, the chip maker, to NVIDIA, who made the GPUs that accelerate a good part of the Blue Waters machine. Uh, this kind of acceleration we exploited uh, tremendously uh, uh, with our simulations. So our program runs actually four times faster on Blue Waters when we add the GPU acceleration to it. And, uh, and uh, Cray, of course, the, 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 um, the, the manufacturer of the machine who developed a uh, communication backbone that we need to understand well in order to use the parallel computer where many of the processors needed to, uh, to communicate with each other. On our side, it was uh, not only the physics professor, Klaus Schulten and his people, but it was particularly the expertise on the uh, computer science side. Uh, on one side, uh, uh, Professor Calais from my university, who is an expert in parallel programming, and internationally renowned, and then Wen Mei Wu, an expert, an, an electric computer engineering professor, an expert in GPU acceleration. And so it was actually a huge team that worked actually for six years, literally, to make this possible. I cannot tell you at how many fronts we have to, to work to make this big computation a reality. What 
what's next, gentlemen, with this project? The, the, the promise we made is next. We make the promise that we uh, discovered the chemical structure of the capsid that is an ideal target for, for a new kind of drugs. And that is what Juan Peria is doing now, day and night. I'm, I'm surprised that he's awake here. Uh, he works day and night uh, to see how the various uh, candidate drugs actually interact uh, with the capsid. And um, I'm not allowed to say more because this is ongoing research. And, uh, we don't have really quite the final results yet, but we have already some fascinating insights into how these drugs may actually work and how they might be designed to interfere with the complex function of a capsid in the human infected cell. But maybe uh, um, Kua can tell us a little bit more about uh, what he is doing right now because he's actually the one who is in the trenches and pushes uh, the simulations forward. So I think um, what, I, what, I, uh, what I can say is um, we're studying how some compounds interact with the capsid and um, we're also looking into some of the interactions that are in nature between the capsid and, uh, and some other proteins that are known to destabilize it and in, uh, in living cells. So we are looking, now that we have the structure, we're looking into ways of breaking it down essentially. Okay, we have a question by email, and the question is from Andy Boyles from ACS, AC, ugh, ASCR Discovery, and Andy asks, how many runtime hours did this study take? What software was used? Something specifically written for this project? And then he asks, what's next for Blue Waters and the software? So who would like to take a crack at that one? So we um, runtime we use something over a million not hours of uh, Blue Waters uh, supercomputing time, and um, we use NAMD with uh, the GPU accelerated uh, part of it, and uh, to prepare the system we use VMD. Uh, the same we use uh, VMD has capabilities to analyze large data sets, so we also use that for for data analysis. Um, other than that, we essentially relied on, uh, yeah, well, what NAMD can provide, all the MDFF uh, features, and uh, and that was pretty much all the, all the software we used for, for this kind of calculation. So, so, so I may add here that the software that runs on Blue Waters called NAMD um, is a uh, um, a very popular program. It is used by about 50,000 uh, registered users. Every time we have a new version, we are getting many thousand uh, downloads, actively used program that you can actually run from your laptop all the waters with the same kind of program system and um, user interface. So whatever advance if you make on Blue Waters that helps the absolute top science also actually benefits uh, many other users. So, uh, so NEMD is uh, very popular and uh, is among a group of uh, two to three programs in the world, one of the leading uh, simulation programs for macromolecular systems. The other software that uh, permits us to set up these simulations and then to analyze them afterwards is called VMD. VMD has over 200,000 registered users. Every time we, we have a new release, uh, 30, 40,000 people uh, download a new version of uh, VMD. And VMD, just like uh, NMD, had to also be prepared to handle such large structures. And actually, the, the VMD program that is doing the analysis also runs on blue waters. And it, it, uh, about one third of our computer time is being spent usually for analysis on blue waters. So it's not just the simulation itself, 
uh, that is complex uh, rather the analysis of the of the simulation is a very complex process but anyway the software um, is a popular software that uh, benefits a, a wide group of people all the way up to blue waters and it has developed in illinois uh, funded actually by uh, the national science foundation as well as by the national institutes of health uh, since many years. Okay, that's all I have for questions at the moment. I'm going to ask each of you for any final comments, and then if there are no more questions, I guess we'll adjourn. But first, Klaus, are there things that were not covered in the broadcast so far that you think are worth raising at this moment? In closing. Yeah, I, uh, I am now uh, in uh, in research since 40 years uh, as, an, as an academic uh, professor and um, I realize that circumstances are tremendously important. We always think that it is our ingenuity. We are all geniuses and that is how we push science forward. But uh, truth is, at least from my perspective, uh, is that circumstances are very, very important, usually more important than our own ingenuity. And so that is what we actually uh, have here at the situation with Blue Waters. It is a new circumstance that we are very, very fortunate uh, to have, and that really permits the new science. Of course, we have to work very hard, and we have to be really smart about it. But uh, this is just simply a new set of circumstances or facts that permits us to do completely new things. And uh, I'm very, very grateful uh, for this. I'm particularly also to the people who made this possible, and, uh, uh, to the taxpayers of this country. And uh, I'm, of course, also very, very excited about uh, the discoveries we made already with uh, Blue Waters just during the test period. So all what we are talking about here, with very few exceptions at the very end, was all done during the, test, uh, during the testing of Blue Waters. So it just really showed uh, that it is a tremendously wonderful computational microscope uh, instrument, a powerful instrument, that, uh, that the National Science Foundation has organized here uh, for, for U.S. science. Would you like to add anything to Klaus's statements? Um, yeah, I think um, I will add that um, despite this being a computational project, there was a strong uh, experimental part as well. Like uh, many of the things we did, um, many of the uh, structures we derived, they, had, uh, they were verified in living cells and also we use uh, these are not just models out of the blue these models come from uh, experimental data so this was a, a mixed approach to the problem it was not only computational but it was a uh, computational and experimental that's what i would add to what klaus said thank you for adding that now irene there are a handful of other teams currently working on blue waters do you anticipate we'll find exciting breakthroughs from them do you have anything well <laughs> Well, I, I think something that Klaus said um, is, uh, is very appropriate to highlight here. Uh, so these teams are working um, to push forward the boundary from what is known, uh, from what is currently unknown to what is known. And in many cases, they have very bold goals. And I think it's been a very fortunate confluence, uh, certainly not an accident, but a very fortunate confluence uh, that has resulted in uh, these really spectacular findings uh, early in the life of Blue Waters. And I believe that there will be others, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, one, one learns from one's failures and not all of the planned computational experiments will go as smoothly or as uh, have as dramatic a success. Um, so, but, but on the other hand, one learns from one's failures as well. And as Klaus pointed out, um, with the case with NAMD and VMD is also true in many, if not most, of the cases. Um, the uh, software that is being used 
And frankly, the data that's being produced by these computational experiments will have lives beyond uh, merely the one uh, project goal. And so I, I know that there are and will be enormous benefit to the communities overall as a result of that. And I'm very confident that we're going to have additional successes. I just don't know how many or when. I do know that for this year, we're, we are fully subscribed on the system. So we're starting to turn to next year to start up lining uh, competitively new research teams to use the system. Well, that's great news. Uh, remember, if if you have tuned in late and you want to catch this webcast, um, even before the embargo lifts, you may contact me, lisajoy at nsf.gov, and I can get that copy to you. The embargo will lift tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please hold your information, write excellent stories, and you can let them go at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you to Dr. Klaus Schulten and Dr. Juan Perilla from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Thank you, Irene Qualters from the National Science Foundation. I'm Lisa Joy Zagorski with NSF, and I'm signing off. Thanks for joining us.